Saints of the Household from author Ari Tyson is a novel woven in a gorgeous marriage of poetry and prose that presents a story of brotherhood, heritage, and choices made to defend a family member who suffers a violent act at the hands of a high school star athlete. In this debut, Ari gives us a story of brothers Jay and Max, two indigenous Ribri American teenagers growing up in Minnesota. At major turning points of their lives, each is dealing with abuse at the hands of their father in ways that cause unrest in their home and in their relationship with each other. We were extremely fortunate to speak with Ari about her book and growing up as one of the only five Ribri Americans in the country while stitching her people's culture into the foreground of her novel. Stay with us for another episode of the Vulgar Geniuses Podcast. Are you currently looking for a bookstore that has a great selection of books? Well, Kizzy's Books and More is that bookstore. Visit www.kizzysbooksandmore.com to purchase your next book for our book club. Use coupon code VULGARGENIUS to receive 10% off the subtotal of your first order. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Vulgar Geniuses Podcast. We are your hosts. My name is Denny. And I am Veronica. And today we are joined by our debut writer. Uh, her name is Ari Tyson. Ari is a Bree Bree American and African descendant poet and storyteller. Her poems and short works have been published in Yellow Medicine Review, The Under Review, Rock and Sling, and Poetry's first ever edition for children. She was the winner of the 2018 Vonda Michaud Nelson Award for a BIPOC writer with Learner Publishing. She currently is the annual broadside editor for a Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop, where she gets to collaborate with the Minnesota Center for the Book of Arts to bring incarcerated voices into the world. Saints of the Household is her debut novel, and she is here to talk to us all about it. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Ari? Oh, I'm super happy to be here. Thank you all for having me. Thank you for coming. Uh, like we said, uh, when we first started talking to you, this is this is a pleasure and a treat for us. Um, we're very excited to talk to you about your your debut um, book. This ha- is a lot of firsts for us. And, you know, but before we go into that, as you already know, since you're an avid listener, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to put you in the hot seat. So I'm going to pass it off to Denny. Yes. Um, you know, we, we do this so we can get to know you and our listeners can get to know, you know, the person behind the book. Yes. Um. So what is your son currently obsessed right now besides you ah, besides me that's good uh yes, the guitar they... oh <laughs> my son is obsessed with the guitar oh it's it's precious my husband's a musician and so there's guitars everywhere and he kind of has his own that was my dad's former guitar and it's just laying on the floor always and he's just plucking at it so yep <laughs> oh a musician in the making yeah i know i'm fighting for poetry but music's winning <laughs> <laughs> it'll come it'll, it'll come because when he start putting them words together he gotta write lyrics right oh, so. that's true that's true <laughs> <laughs> we're making a triple threat <laughs> yes um, what reminds you of home? Oh my goodness. Hot chocolate. Oh. Um, that I think is probably the thing because um, you know, my it's it's kind of it's to my bo- roots both ways. My mom, my white mom would make it for me in our kind of separate house, but also it's ancestral for me on my brewery side. So that's that's that brings me home wherever I am. Oh, nice best thing about being from both Bri and African descent mm. oh I was just uh, the culture right holding both of them is just beautiful it's it's a gift um you know you don't have to say yes or no to the other um sometimes that's hard hard space to hold I'm learning how to do that but um you know I I think it's just I think it's just a gift to be able to hold ancestry and history uh from two very strong people groups Mm-hmm. um and being able to hold those both um mm-hmm. is a gift you know 
What makes you laugh out loud? You know, my husband is is absolutely hilarious. He's just so funny. And so he's usually the one that can get me to laugh pretty hard. And I don't even know what it's about, but it's just something, something out of nowhere and it'll get me going. Oh, sure. see, true love exists, y'all. Don't hate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so if we are going on a road trip with Jay and Max, the characters in your book, where are we going? Oh, well, yeah, for those who read the book, you're going to the field, of course, this, uh, the space where they remember their childhoods um, and being able to kind of be who they are on, on this field of goldenrod uh, just outside of their town. Mm. This, this is a question from a friend. Go ahead. Oh, I'll, I'll ask it. <laughs> um, in 2015, you dressed up as a side table from Blue's Clues for a Christmas party. The question is, why? <laughs> <laughs> that is an old photo. Whoa. Uh, I have, well, one for one, I didn't want to be basic and I didn't want to dress up as one of the Blue Clues characters <laughs> that everybody knows. Two, I knew that a, I was poor and a college student has a box. Like you can find a box. Um, three, I had a lot of orange in my closet. And so it just worked. Uh, people, people could see me from across the campus because I would be wearing like a neon orange jacket, my neon orange uh, backpack and like hot pink boots or something like that. Like it was ridiculous. What? Yeah. So I all of those things added up and I said yes to the side table and I got to hold the clue. The clue was in my little box, my little drawer that I pulled out. But why? Why were you all dressing up for Christmas? Oh, that's the question. That's the question. Uh, it was for an English major party. We It was like, uh, what was the theme? It was like mystery detective theme. Uh, and it was like the end of the semester party. It's something that they do at our my former college. And uh, yeah, so we were dressing up as a detective group. And so we thought Blue's Clues. And I saw that picture and I was like, oh, this is cute. And I have questions. So Thank you. <laughs> Thank That's you a cute sign. <laughs> So Ari, right, we're gonna we're gonna get into the meat of the conversation. When when did you knew that you wanted to be an auto ethnographer and a preserver of culture? Mm, that's such a good question. I you know I I always wanted to I always wanted to do that work, but because I uh you know was so far away from my people, um, and my dad was sick for the last seven years, so we didn't really get to travel very much um, during that period of time. Um, to see our family, you know, all, of our, all my aunties and uncles and everybody live on our territory um, or near it. And so it really, you know, it became possible when my mentor moved to town um, and he's a member of our tribe. He's We're actually cousins, you know, always cousins, you know, but we're related. And once, you know, and he had a heart for teaching. He loved, he loved to teach and he loves to teach still. The first thing he did when he arrived to the States was book uh a community class, community mm. ed class to teach brewery culture. Um, and I showed up <laughs> and that's where I met him. And that's how we got to know each other. Uh, Cause I had heard through the grapevine that another brewery was moving to the United States uh, and Minnesota, my own town, Minneapolis uh, at the time, which was just absolutely wild. Um, and he loved, he, he loved, he was curious. We both are incredibly curious people and we ask a lot of questions. And so he had a lot of answers and I had a lot of questions, um, but it was because he had had a lot of questions before, right? Generationally, right? He was curious. So um, so now I'm just grateful to have so much knowledge and perspective from him um, and also my aunties and stuff. Now that I've been able to go back uh, and visit my my uh, territory more often, then now I get to, you know, ask my aunties and other other elders information too in, in history. But it was really special. It started with my mentor for sure, Biner. I, I saw that you uh, had done a blog. I was trying to find it um, about how there are only five, there were only five of you all in the U. Are you talking about the entire United States or just where you, the entire United States? Entire Can you speak a little bit more on that blog? I, I was trying to find it, but I couldn't. I oh, couldn't yeah. Find it. Uh, that's a Love Powers blog. Um, yes. And so sh she invited me to do a guest blog and I was thinking, oh what am I what am I feeling right now and it was kind of after I had sold my book and it, it you know it did pretty well I, and I the only reason why I share that is just because I think it's good for BIPOC folks to see 
BIPOC folks getting paid for their work. <laughs> so it's not a flex on my part. It's just it's just me wanting to be honest. Um, and for myself, it was, you know, I, I feel like I, I we got a good deal for it. Um, and uh, yeah, so from there, I, I think I just was wondering, you know, who in the world is going to read this book? Uh, I have five of my people group here. And wow. if those five people buy the book, then that will be it in the United States. And then everybody, then my audience is everybody else, right? Uh, the word is sequa in bravery. Anybody that's not bravery is sequa. Um, and yeah, so that was a really interesting space for me to hold and try to f- figure out what I thought about that space. Because, you know, some, I feel like some folks, we could get to write towards representation. And that's true for me in other ways. Um, or for p- folks who belong to your culture to experience your art um and I hope that my tribe will it just will the work will have to be translated to Spanish Mm -hmm. for the most part um and some breweries who speak English will be able to experience it but the majority speak Spanish and the majority of that actually speak bravery as well so there's just you know um you know I just have a different audience than than maybe other folks do uh so it just changes the conversation but I realized you know the more that the more that I thought about books that affected me, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't hundred percent me on the page. Um, they could still influence me and still make me become a writer. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. if, if a book can do that and it's not my own people on the page, um, you know, that's, that's the power of story, I think. And so that kind of grounds me a bit too, is remembering, remembering that while I write. Thank you for sharing that. That is wild to me though. Only five. Yes. I, when I read it, I was like, wait a There's minute, does no she way. mean like where she's from? Because I, I, I could not grasp what that what that actually meant until you just now explained it. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so, we were delighted when we saw how you wrote Jay and Max's voice voices. It, it spoke to your poetry background and the love that you have for that craft. So having that background, what are the advantages do you think that helped you find their unique voices when you were writing them on the page. Yeah, I, I think Max is probably the easiest one to talk about in that he is so artistic. And so I feel like if you listen to, you know, painters or sculptors talk about their art, and I did, I, I dove into archives and videos of writer, or, you know, um, artists talking about their work and they sound like poets. They really do. You know, they, you know, they have all these reasons and concepts and ideas behind what they're doing. Um, and so he just translated a poetry so well in that way. Um, poetry has what I call like rhetoric. It has these lines of statement of belief. Like, you know, I think, I think he says at one point, you know, like what is art if not for transformation, right? Like there's all these statements with these big feelings, right? Like it's a very like paintery thing, but also poets have really big feelings and really big thoughts so it translated really well there the cool part about Jay is that he's kind of written in these kind of heavier vignettes right these kind of paragraphs that actually mimics like my autoethnographer work like we have if you were to write down a bravery story um you know it'd be kind of that similar shape like thick maybe more straightforward um you know, and there are some myths in the in the book itself or some stories of ours, legends. Um, and those kind of right, those still take up that one page, you know, that they 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 can hold one page and that's it. Um, and so you just have to kind of realize that, oh, right, something small can be really powerful. And I think that's that's Jay too. Um, so that's kind of where I think about their forms and kind of what my right, you know, where I got to explore with my own craft with with these two different voices. Speaking of those Bree Bree stories, I bet there's thousands, millions of them. Um, you know, we you know, we wanted to ask how pivotal was it to choose the one that you chose for the book and why why were those chosen specifically? Yeah, yeah, right. There's stories for everything, you know, right? So it's it was, it was a lot. But you know what? Once my mentor told me this story, and it was actually interesting because this the 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 legend kind of came after I'd written the bones of the book. And then I was really drawn to, like, when I learned that legend, right? I mean, of course, it's way older than the book. So that's the mystical part of it, right? Like, you know, there's this, like, this, it's all connected in a wild way. And I didn't retell the legend in any way to help my story out. It was literally format, you know, that way. Um, It's translation work there. And so, yeah, so once I heard it, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is totally 
Max and Jay in metaphor and you know it, it just visualizes what the kind of work that they're doing and trying to do and the kind of pain and violence of it and all that you know all those themes and the cool thing about you know legends is that there's just so much room to explore uh what were the emotions behind all of that and what are the reasons and you know nothing's saying this is good or bad or this is perfect or unperfect it's you know it's a community trying to get rid of something terrible um and so right what does that mean when it's the boy's life so I just couldn't I you know I couldn't I couldn't just not put it in there right once I learned it about it and it really helped the book really flesh out and take you know, so many more layers. Uh, and I just love that idea of our stories have existed in us a lot longer, even when we don't know them. Um, and so for me, I, you know, I feel like I was almost doing a retelling before I even knew I was, you know, just because that's where my roots are from. Uh, so anyway, yeah. <laughs> I love those stories so much, especially the creation story and having this understanding of like the names that get passed down. It's not the, it's not the patriarchal name It's coming from the mom and I'm just like, this is so beautiful. Just everything in in all of that is just just wonderful. And just thank you for for sharing that. Um. So we see that these two brothers are having these internal external battles about their home and their future, right? And so Jay and Max are these two young young men growing up to become adults that are trying to figure out how to live in this world with opposing thoughts about what should be important for them in the midst of all that is happening around them and to them. Will you talk to us about making the decision to have them go these, like these separate directions at certain points throughout the book? Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like the, the visual of it is, you know, they, they kind of have their own story arcs, but they're kind of separate from each other. So instead of getting like, like one story arc, you kind of, <laughs> for lack of a better word you get like an m shape yeah uh, right and so when one's declining one's improving and one's one's improving one's, you know that kind of thing they've got this kind of shape to them it's really fun to explore and play with but i i think that anything you know maybe i feel like this for one is when you start growing you notice maybe the lack of growth in other people or, mm -hmm. or, you know, you're not always, you're not on the same journey as anybody, you know, even your sibling, you could be, you could be right in the case of Max and Jay, you're, you know, you've got these same roots and histories and everything, but you're still going to come at things differently because you're different people. Um, and so I think for me, you know, showing the different ways that they kind of ex have experienced something and the ways that they look at it and express themselves I just I, I think it hopefully gives a little bit of hope in a sense of like you know we all go through a lot of things and we have different tools for it some of us go to the paint some of us go to the studio and paint other of us need to like sit with their cousin and talk about feelings and stuff right like it's just it's just part of the healing journey and so I think for them it it just really brought up a lot of different questions for each of them and then that made their story arcs different uh and it really was it was a, it was a blast to get to to think through their um think through their thoughts and look through their eyes and see how that affected who they ended up being by the end of the book yeah because when I was reading it you know I was just kind of like amazed about things that I probably hadn't really given too much time until probably picking up this particular book about what it is to have like these opposing thoughts of like you wanting to branch out and be your own person but then you're seeing that these two boys are trying to wrestle with like well do we stay home you know having to protect our mom you know uh, it, having to like basically mourn the loss of this relationship with our father and probably with each other if that doesn't ever get you know repaired and and just seeing all of these things work within themselves this, this was like really something to show the dynamics of what it is to not only be in relationship with one other person but to be in relationship with yourself because you're constantly having to go mm -hmm. through those things right absolutely that's a beautiful summary I'll just take that that's good <laughs> you know no, just kidding <laughs> You we'll give we'll give you the clip. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we're we're talking about one of one of the one of the boys. So Jay Jay is the older brother, and I feel like he has inhabited this space of you know let me be the one that fixes all the problems. Mm -hmm. 
he was forced to look after and protect his mom and you know consequentially also max um as readers who recognize that you know the situation that they're that they're in is absolutely unjust can you speak more on those ongoing abuses that are happening in households of color particularly particularly within the indigenous community mm, yeah yeah you know i think for one it's just hard to recognize when it's happening you know when you're in it it can be really difficult to know um and for me, it was really important to write a book where the, they were aware that it was wrong right away because that will help. I, at least it, you know, I think where I've seen other books where at least maybe the journey of the characters recognizing something was wrong was really important. Um, and so I think that the voice start there is is helpful in that sense. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, the greater community, it's, it's you know, it's just, it's just a heavy place, right? I, I think for me, when I think about this book, I don't, I don't want people to feel alone. I want them to be able to see maybe the truth of what's going on in their home spaces, if this is something that's going on. Um, but also the, the permission to share and mm -hmm. to tell somebody, um, however that looks right like it might turn into something like it was for max and jay it might not it may turn into something else you know i'm not necessarily like pro prison or anything like that um but it's you know i think there's complicated stuff behind that too so the book isn't like an outline for what should happen or what will happen or any of that kind of stuff but i feel like there's you know how can we bring justice into into our houses how can we bring safety um is it inviting elders in? Is it sharing with elders? Is it, you know, even for smaller relationships, like with, not, I shouldn't say smaller, but with Nicole and Luca, right? You know, what kind of justice did they bring? It was kind of not trickery, but in a way, it was very smart justice, right? A different, to me, it's like indigenous justice there. Like that was like, you know, revealing, revealing somebody to the whole community and saying, look at this guy, right? Mm. Um, I love that, right? There's, we have all these trickster stories doing the exact same th thing in indigenous stories from up and down the Americas. And so that was really special to get to write into that narrative too. But um, yeah, you know, I don't have the answers or anything like that, because I think every situation is different. Um, and I think we all do harm, but at the same time, it's not an excuse to keep doing harm. Um, and I, I, I hope that anyway, that folks feel less alone when they read this um, and that they have the tools they, they need maybe to heal or to recognize that you don't always get better right away, but the resources are there to grow and to heal. Um, and they're just around you, whether it's in your friends or your family or faith communities, all that kind of stuff, right? It's all all, all good for you. Um, and and that's kind of what, what I think about with this book anyway. So let me ask you, you know, normally this is a question that we ask at the at the top of the hour, but I was just curious as to know uh, where did you draw this story from? Like, where did it come from uh, that you were like, okay, this is, this is who I want to talk about and this is the subject that I want to talk about while infusing your your heritage within the book. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm pretty, you know, I, I didn't go into specific details, but when I when I talk to teenagers, you know, I, I'm pretty clear, like, I grew up in an abusive household. This is something that, you know, not necessarily in the exact same ways, but in similar ways and some very sim and some very same, like are the same. But, you know, and I try to be vulnerable with that so that other people have the ability to be vulnerable with that too, right? If you need me to say that to, in order to help you to say that about your own house, like, you know, I want to be that for you if I can be as an author, writer. But um, so, yeah, that's really where it, I, it, you know, this book um, kind of hit like a lightning bolt. I think Amber McBride was talking on here too, that sometimes these verse novels or books come super fast. Um, and the bones of this one did the same thing. Um, and I think it was because of me having it just being so close to my life but I needed the distance with writing from the perspective of two boys um, uh, who are similar, but different enough for me. And then I could explore it as a fiction writer where mm -hmm. I can put on different perspectives and hats and think through different people's experiences. But uh, for me, there is a really big common thread for sure between my own life and my own narrative and, and the narrative of these boys. I think there's like a power when it comes to wanting to touch on certain things from your own personal life and putting them in fiction is probably like the best jumping off point because we had a conversation with Kiese and I just asked him I was like do you think that 
uh, writing Long Division, his first fictional piece to get published, was your way of like working out a lot of the things that you wanted to talk about when you wrote Heavy. Because when you read those two things, they go so perfectly together, right? Where you're like, you know, there's this like uh, the, the relationship with him and his and this, his parent, his grandparent and and all of those struggles that the child is growing up with. And then you go and you read, you pick up heavy and you're just like, OK, all right. I just feel like maybe this was probably a little bit of a precursor into like, OK, now I need to write what I want to write. And then I know. I feel like I know I don't know if you feel like this <laughs> but I feel like poetry and poets tend to be not only the people who call out on the injustices and or the beautiful things within the world but they also do it about themselves a little bit easier than someone else who could just sit with it I just feel like it's just a, a easier way I I've, I always say like I, I like to tell my business in that form is mm -hmm. it the same with you oh absolutely absolutely I think some of my first early poetry or my poem publications were definitely you know about my own life and vulnerable and important they were um big steps for me in my own journey and so I do think poetry hits those tenors for us mm -hmm. um and I, you know, Ada Limon says that, you know, she is the speaker in all of her poems. She's not putting on a different, you know, <laughs> different uh, So I'm stealing her line here, but like in terms of poem, my own personal poetry, for sure, I'm the speaker. <laughs> no, <laughs> no persona poems for me, unless I'm writing fiction, you know, then 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 we're putting on Max's voice. But uh, yeah, for sure. When it's poetry, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to thank you for that honesty too, because you know, not everybody can immediately, uh, you know, be, admit or like know themselves that well enough to be like, yeah, you know, I draw it up on on my personal experiences, um, because you know, it's 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 nice to hide behind somebody else. It's nice to hide, you know, from you know, it's nice to create to these characters. But I think I appreciate that honesty because it makes readers feel that you know, you are you you can go through the same things and also come out from the same things I think it's very important to see that fact that you know somebody else did it so I think I can too and especially you know for young adults where your book was you know dedicated to that it's it's important for them to see to see those kinds of stuff yeah it's something about being an artist mm -hmm. and revealing yourself right like to the world through your through the way that you do it um, but we love we love the relationship between Jay and his grandfather. Uh, his grandfather served as Jay's moral compass and his lifeline to his identity. How important was it for you to include his grandfather and how he was instrumental uh, within for this book's uh, completion? Yeah, well, our elders have so much wisdom, yes. right? You know, uh, they they have lived through a lot of life that. Uh, perhaps in some ways we have as well, but other parts of life that we haven't, they've got perspective, they've got knowledge, right? I'm going to my elders for stories and for wisdom. And I think that there's no shame in that. <laughs> and so I think for Jay, you know, I think sometimes as Americans, you know, we have, you know, in American culture, like, oh, like, you you know like you can take advice from your you know like with your parents like you don't even take advice from your parents like why do you take it you know but like you know your elders are important and not saying that this is your parents in this way but I think grandparents and other folks with age um in our communities have a lot of wisdom and insight not to say it's perfect or anything like that or they don't have their own traumas but I you know I think for for Jay it was so important for him to have those intergenerational relationships um and and they did, they transformed him and they gave him insight and they also helped him not feel so alone, right? That his grandfather had had a brother that had committed suicide and all, you know, things like that where he's, his grandfather can speak into his own life and his experiences that Jay was going through um, and see him and sit with him and had the experience enough to know not to necessarily tell him what to do, but to just be with him in the midst of those kinds of hard spaces. Because, you know, a lot of kids coming off of traumatic situations like Jay, myself included, went through a huge bout of situational depression. It wasn't necessarily clinical, but it was situational. 
it, it hits, you know, it hits really heavy right there. It doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, for some folks, right, depression is chronic, but there are also these other spaces where depression shows up. Uh, surviving abuse and trauma is one of them, um, along with PTSD, right, all the kind of stuff. Um, and so I, I think for for Jay, having his grandfather be familiar with similar feelings and emotions, um, and also being able to speak in to him with story and with language and all of that good stuff from his people, his roots, uh, it meant a lot more, right? Like I, I think I talked about at one part there was where Jay comes down and his mom and his grandfather are having hot chocolate. And it was like, the smell of it was like waking up his ancestors and they were like mm -hmm. helping him forward. Um, and so I, I think about those moments where again, you know, even intergenerational ancestors, right? Before the people that we don't even get to see um, are still influencing who we are and can remind us um, to, to keep, to keep moving forward, um, even when it feels absolutely impossible sometimes. <laughs> I wish more young people would be able to have experiences like that, to for them to be open and also for the elders to be more open and sharing. Because I think one thing that the youth don't realize, and even all up to until you are probably maybe in your late 20s, early 30s, that your parents and your grandparents and aunts and uncles and everyone else were once where you were, right? And so no one is ever really talking about like they led these whole other lives other than the life that you think exists only for you, mm. right? <laughs> like your mom was somebody's, somebody's <laughs> everything, right? And so right. to be able to have that conversation with them it's really, truly important, right? And we see that happen with these two characters within the book where they're able to like sit and communicate certain things that I know other young people will be like, I ain't got time for this. I <laughs> hang out with my boys or whatever, right? And I, I, I commend you for writing characters like that because then it'll, I'll allow children who are reading these books to say, okay, maybe there's an untapped resource and I might be able to get some information that, you know, I probably thought I would never get or have to wait to get or thought I knew something and then it's something totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, so who knows? You, you might encourage a whole generation to talk to talk to their elders. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, hopefully. But no, we're, I, I, I think yeah, I think I think teenagers are, are are very smart and they've got their own things that they're bringing. But of course, like, right, we're always in communication with the generations around us, mm -hmm. whether or not we think about it, but just tapping into it, it, it can be real good stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think that's my favorite relationship, Jay and his grandpa, because I was very close to my maternal grandfather. And I think I wish that he was here when my son was born, because I would have probably called him and be like, oh, you know, I've gone through some things like, you know, because I had postpartum depression and it's not a secret. I've told everybody <laughs> that walked through this podcast that it has <laughs> happened. And I think part of the healing was talking about it. And mm -hmm. the only thing that I really was like, oh, I wish my grandpa was here because I'm sure, you know, he would have some words for me. Like he went through a whole war, like World War Two. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, postpartum depression might be big for me then, but I've, I'm sure like, you know, he can he would have helped in some way, shape or form for me because he loves me, you know? So I, that's one thing that I, I wish I experienced, but you know, we have other memories. So I'm like, when I saw grandpa was coming, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it was, it was so much fun to read. And then like, uh, you know, just like a follow up question to that. It's like, you know, Jay would want to do a, you know, if you haven't read the book, I'm sorry, you can pause and come back. But like, he's doing like a whole gap year and then like traveling to Costa Rica with grandpa. And I'm mm -hmm. like, can you talk about how powerful and healing could that be for Jay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think for me getting to go back home, and that's how I put it, because it is going back home. It's in my land is, is just it's so good. And indigenous people say, you know, if you are struggling or you're having a tough time, like go back home. <laughs> like You gotta, you gotta go be with your people. <laughs> if you're struggling, go back home. And so I think about that. I couldn't, I couldn't include it in the book, but I wanted it to be part of Jay's journey. Um, 
And so I think it is, it's big in a lot of ways. It depends on who you are and what you're going through, but um, just being not alone, remember, hearing your indigenous language, just like hearing that spoken over you, whether or not you understand every word, it just, it's so grounding. Um, my auntie lives on the land my father uh, grew up on. Um, and my I lost my dad in July and, you know, getting to be there again and thinking, oh, my dad ran around here as a little one and now I'm bringing my baby here, mm -hmm. right? It's just, there's something different about that and thinking, oh, my grandmother harvested, you know, platanos here or something, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Like, I, you know, she worked hard and I'm working hard and she was known for working hard. That was her stuff. Like she was, everybody was like, oh, she's such a hard working woman. That's the, that's her legacy. Um, and she had, she raised all these wonderful kids and, um, you know, I just, there's just all those kinds of legacies that you, you get to recognize when you go back home. Um, and not to say you can't feel them when you're away, you can. Um, and for Jay, I, I think it's, he didn't get to go back home because of all the abuses. And that was a season for my life. I wasn't allowed to go to Costa Rica for quite a few seasons of my life as a child, um, despite my dad wanting me to go. I really wanted to go, but I wasn't allowed um, from other sides of things. And so um, that was hard, right? Situationally, I couldn't do anything about it because I was a kid. But when you get older, you get to make your own decisions. And that's where Jay is, <laughs> um, right? So, I, and I love that. I love getting to empower him to be able to go that way. Yeah, mm. it's that reckoning because, like you know, like we were t we were just talking to Jamil um, Dan Kochai. Um, mm. You know, he he talks about Afghanistan and Logar being his home, and then I told him like your body just knows so when you go back. You know, because I didn't grow up here; I grew up in the Philippines. So when you go back, there's this this feeling that your body's like, I can relax now. It's like even though it's like the worst conditions. Like your body just know, like your feet has touched the ground. Mm. It it's it's a different feeling, and I don't think I can explain it in words. It's just I don't know. Maybe you can explain it in words, <laughs> Ari. <laughs> and then I'll be like, then I'll be gonna be using that every time. Like according to Ari, that <laughs> this is how it feels like to go back home. You know, but it's it's a shared feeling that it's it's a very special feeling that I think you know maybe immigrants or displaced people or indigenous people can can definitely put a put a mark on absolutely I love that yeah you know I was I was thinking you know um when I visited I would talk about oh I'm going to my territory or like I'm doing this right well once I got to the land I was like oh this now this is no longer my territory this is our territory because now I'm not in a different culture a different space now it's like I'm with my people and so this is our land, right? It's not my land, like I have to say in the States, right? It's mm -hmm. ours. And so just even that switch, right? All of a sudden you're not alone. Um right. and that's that that is a gift. Um and it's a privilege, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't so hard to travel, I, you know, that kind of thing. And so I, I I ache and I hunger with those that maybe haven't. Um, but I'd say, you know, learning your stories, learning, and, you know, all of those other ways of avenues of finding identity are really, as you know, just as important and just as grounding. For a lot of Indigenous people, knowing our stories, um, it lessens uh, the, I guess, the degree of despair in our young people. Mm -hmm. For example, folks that, you know, the teenagers that are more likely to commit suicide are, are teenagers, Indigenous teenagers that don't know their creation stories. And so these stories are powerful. They heal and they save lives. They do. And um, and so I, I think about that too, the power of story, the power of land, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it, it's, it's been an honor to explore and uh, right. It, it feels good to be able to go home, but you get to go home in our stories too, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. What do you want to say about, you know, showing up for your sibling, especially when they need you the most? Ooh, uh, I, I like this. I like this a lot. Um, I have a very complicated sibling dynamics. I am the oldest, the youngest, and the middle child, depending on which family you look at. And mm -hmm. for a while, I was the only. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I've got lots of sibling dynamics. And But I, it's been interesting to see what showing up means for different 
Well, for my 13 year old brother, it's something different. You know, I might be sitting next to his 3D printer and letting him show me something that I, you know, I, I have no words for, but I'm happy to sit there and watch what he's doing. <laughs> he's so smart. I'm so impressed. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Right for my older sisters, it's different. You know, I got older older sisters in their forties, and you know, it's it's you know maybe taking their babies so they can go on a date, or maybe it's you know getting to sneak away and go dance our hearts out at a family wedding. You know, so just different stuff. But I yeah, so I but I will say this that Max and Jay are completely fiction in the sense that I don't have any siblings that are so close to me in age, mm -hmm. and so for me it was it was an exploration you kind of being jealous of people who get to do that who have those relationships I knew a set of twins in high school and oh my goodness they could finish each other's sentences they could they could sing songs in harmony and they could you know they could like do rap battles together and they had all these all these bits all this all these bits that they could do between each other and it would just be it was so cool and I was so in a way so jealous um and and so I I think about them sometimes and I I, I don't know maybe, who knows maybe way in my subconscious the inspiration for this book but uh that you know so I've always been fascinated by those relationships that are so tight and close because I didn't have I didn't necessarily have that until I got older um and caught up to my sister's age or you know now as my brother's getting older we're starting to get to have those you know deeper relationships um, and so, yeah, that's, I, I think it was, for me, it was in this way, a lot of imagination, getting to explore what that relationship looked like. Yeah. See, shout out to the twins. Hopefully you listen to this podcast. You don't even <laughs> know there's a book about you. <laughs> I didn't know it going to come up, but apparently they did. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as we've been talking about uh, throughout this podcast, your book consists of a family that is Bri Bri, which are people who are indigenous to Costa Rica and Northern Panama. You included a few conversations uh, in the book that have the Bri Bri language. Uh, my old roommate is from Nicaragua and is a descendant of the Mosquito people. He told me a story about when he moved to the States. He moved first to Texas before he came to Florida. And being in a class uh, where he was asked, a new student came in and he was asked to translate for this new student. But this problem was, was that the student spoke Spanish and he was like, I don't, I don't speak. How am I going to translate? And that was the first time that I found out that he had spoken another language um, I just assumed that he spoke Spanish because that's what I heard him. And he was like, that's not my first language. He's like, I learned only because I had to translate for all of these other people. Mm -hmm. How does it feel knowing that every time you pick up your book, you know that if, like you were saying, there might be only five of you here, but the possibility of this book reaching to um, other people who speak the same language as you, who can find themselves within the story, or just indigenous people in general who can relate back to this book. What does that feel for you every time you like see this book and you're looking mm -hmm. at it and you're like, this is now out in the world? Yeah, you know, it feels like a capsule is the word that I feel like, not because I've contained something, but just because I think about for, I, and I guess maybe the best metaphor is that I think about what I would have loved to have as a child and what I get to leave for my son and for my brother mm -hmm. and for the generations that come after, right? Like that won't get to be their story because this is what we got to do now. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's enough for me. Like I could just cry all over that, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's not anything that I did. It, it goes back to my dad being here in the States or it goes back to my, um, my grandmother deciding that she wanted her kids to go to student visa, right? It goes back to my African ancestors, you know, running away and being mosquito as well, right? Like I likely have mosquito heritage because they, you know, connected with the indigenous folks who made their own people and crowned their own king, right? Like these, these are my ancestors and it's it's just all the way, all the way back to them. And I'm just one one part of it. Um, but it feels really good to be able to hold hold the language. And like you say too, say I bring the book back to and I will to my territory. It's like at least, you know, we've got briefery in there. You can read a conversation. You can see a Bri language and it's not necessarily translated either. So it's really, you know, it's kind of, it's, 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 in that sense, it's very much for them. And, and it's for me and, and for, for my family as well. 
Um, and that, you know, it's really hard to put right a, a quantity on that. I, I, I feel so honored and, so, and grateful. And even for my publisher, right, to be like, I feel like my book in a way is a litmus test right? They say like, oh, you know, BIPOC books don't sell, you know, can't sell or, oh, like they can't do this or whatever. Like, right. It's it's like, well, you know what, if you can like pay a person that has five people from their indigenous group, well, you know, like I said, I have my, my whole, they like other sides and parts of myself as well that are represented here. But in that sense, you know, if you can sell a book and you can have readers for it, what does that say about all these other myths and stories that we spin around the idea that you can't, sell books if you know I just think I think my book is kind of has been in a way like a big step up for my publisher to be like no we're going to do this and you know we'll see who reads it right um and that I think for me is is just again another honor in kind of a more western way but um the language itself is 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 very special to get to lean into and, and share here mm. Let's let's talk about that for a little bit uh your book went to auction several times it has it six-figure book deal I want you to talk to us about it going to auction and you getting the whatever number that was that you got and just be sitting there just like what just happened yeah. yes it was it was absolutely wild well because at the beginning of this journey you know sometimes you don't hear back and you know, I think it was six months that we were on submission and we had you know, found some no's or some like comforting yes you know you know like projections and stuff but you know it really was amazing to uh, get to the point of one editor she really loved the book and she had ideas on how to grow it and um and so before the book was even on auction I was actually doing what we call a revise and resubmit where I was revising the the first 30 pages and sending it to her um, and then she would go to her acquisition meetings and try to like convince, you know, marketing that she wanted this book, right? Um, and then we had another editor that was interested and then another editor. And so we ended up having three editors that were interested in the book. And that was really spectacular. And, you know, I, I just, yeah. And to see how much, um, you know, money these publishers have and can pay. And I didn't even get paid as much as some of my friends. You know, I'll talk to some of my friends and I'll be like, oh, I can't pay that one. Uh, but but <laughs> not that in a jealous way, like I'm happy for them. But, you know, you just realize that, you know, like you can, you know, these these publishers have money. They can, they can, they can do better than what they're doing. <laughs> so can mm -hmm. I say that? Um, yeah. And I, you know, um, that, but I, I am grateful at the end of the day for what it ended up being. And I was so excited. I just, I remember being like, what, we got this number and then we got this number and then we got this number and being on the phone with my agent and being like, I did, you know, who knew? Um, Cause at the time I was a poet. I remember uh, having somebody ask me how much I wanted to make. And I, and at the time I was, you know, like this, poet that's poor and I'm like I don't care about money you know like that's what I, said. <laughs> I remember that conversation and I still don't like I'm not a materialistic person like I, don't, I think there's a lot of value in so many other things but again I share it because I want other people of color to know so that this is the standard mm. um I would like this book you know among like others in the past to be a step towards a lot of change um and I think it it came after Firekeeper's Daughter, which Firekeeper's Daughter went to auction. And that's another Native um, um, Ojibwe writer. And she wrote YA. And her book was a directing book through the field. It's just amazing. And so I know that I'm my book is coming out after her. And um, I know it was possible because of what she was doing. And so, again, mm -hmm. like I hope that I can look back and be like, oh, let's see what other books come out after this one um, got to do the work that it is. Reparations, Ari. Reparations. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so yeah, you you fly with that. I'm that is also something very commendable, you know, for you to be like, look, I'm being transparent, so you also can grow and you can fly. Like it's that you know, invi like a really invisible person that you're talking to, but like a mirror of somebody that maybe sees you as, as somebody that has succeeded. So I think that's very powerful to like own and share. Because, you know, a lot of people won't because be like, well, you already know my business through my, my book. Why do I have to share all of this? Mm -hmm. You know, so. But it yeah. helps to know like that, that publishing process, right? Because there are a lot of things that are done in secret that no one knows how all of this is working. And I am still learning all of these things. And no matter how many times we talk to somebody, there's always something that pops up. And I was like, okay, that's a new detail that 
you don't even think about because like you were saying you're having to revise the work and then send it to them so that she can hype it up were you having to revise it every single time with every single editor that wanted it or just for that one time just for her uh and and because I I guess I'm a glutton for punishment I actually went with her because they bid on it and I loved working with her Mm -hmm. I thought she was brilliant and that's my editor Grace like shout out to Grace I absolutely adore her she's brilliant and she did what the book needed and now people are like finishing this book in a night. Like I was a reluctant reader. Like I was a sh- like a very slow reader and I still am. And so to have written a book that people are finishing pretty fast, um, but not missing kind of the depth of it. Right. Cause I, I wouldn't, I hope anyway, that it's not a book that, I don't know that I hope that folks can go back and reread it, I guess is what I'm saying, but right. Like that's work that I learned through working with my editor right so there's a lot of for me I guess I I always want to grow through every experience um and then also like you say like pass it pass it down and hope that the next person has an even easier time or a better time Hmm. so besides this wonderful book that you've created can you also um you know shed some light on the collectives that you are a part of um, like uh, Les Musas and Diverse Verse and how how impactful are these organizations to you and you know to the people that have been in it yes well when I'll first talk about Las Musas because they have been amazing um, also you know they they have been an organization that has been promoting you know um, non-binary folks and, and women voices who are um, reigning for the um, generally the children's field young adult we might have some adult folks too but um, and the idea is the seed of it is that there can't we can't just have one voice out there for a huge diaspora and, and, and beautifully complex word as Latinx. Like even you know even for me like it's interesting holding that word because I'm indigenous. You know I have no Latin American heritage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like you know, I'm not Latin. I, my language is indigenous. We've got we're Tono. We don't even have any. We can't even roll our R's traditionally. Um, so it's very different. Like you like you were saying. Um, Veronica about your friend and so um you know but also that's been super welcoming I felt really at home in those spaces and they really um you know they just promote the idea that there isn't just one story to be told because they're finding that you know somebody would buy a book from let's say a Mexican-American and then you know the publisher would be like oh well we have our Mexican-American you know YA novel so we can't Mm -hmm. buy another one and somebody and the idea is like no this can't be the way it is no way we're not doing this um, and so their whole organization has just been a beautiful wrecking ball through that idea. Um, and they've grown, right? They help each other. Everybody has, and there's mentorships and all that kind of stuff and sharing resources and wisdom and even numbers, right? How much you're getting paid, all that kind of stuff. All that stuff is shared in that group. And it really does. It benefits everybody. And I feel like now we are seeing such a bloom of uh, people from tons of different spaces in the, you know, the Latinx uh, community, because the idea is that there's not just one story. Um, so I love them. I love them for that the concept, that idea. Diverse Verse, I got to be a founding member for. So I got to create their website. I'm really techie. I love the web web stuff, the design, all that stuff. I love it. So I got to help, I got to help create their website and just get to be there. Um, as we just thought about what, what does it look like to be poets who are diverse in various different ways and then really promoting our work collectively. Um, but also, again, paving the way for the next generation. I think the cool thing about these communities is that they are so, like we say, intergenerational. You're always you're always thinking about the person coming after you. And I love that. Like, I would love for my journey to be of service to others. Mm-hmm. Um, that is my goal. And so seeing being part of collectives that believe in that is my jam. <laughs> Can you also talk to us about the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop? You do yeah. so much. Like You're all over the place, girl. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You know, I love, so I work for them now. I'm their mentor coordinator. And so I, what I do is I connect folks who are on the inside, who are um, currently incarcerated, um, and I connect them with, and they're writers, and I connect them with mentors on the outside. Um, and then I work with like the Department of Corrections and we pass basically creative work back and forth and feedback. Um, and it's amazing. I love the program. And so I get to wear more than administrative pad in this one I'm not you know I might give some teaching advice every once in a while but not much um but that's you know it's it's very much me just getting to see these relationships happen and just lightly you know get to be part of them uh and it's it's beautiful that this organization Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop I wish I know there are some like it but I wish every state had something like it because 
it's it's gorgeous and the work that they do is is just beautiful and powerful and it just reminds me that you know how that the power of words really um that 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 language and story they're everywhere no matter where you are um and they can and they can transform and they do and they do all the time where we don't even know it um and i get to you know part of me just getting to be that like touch like i said so that i get to um i get to see those transformations in, in real in real time and it's beautiful it's gorgeous how long have you been with that uh with that organization oh my goodness let me say like four years maybe they've been around so, a while like pre-covid yeah, I was their editor for their their broadside competition. Um, like you guys read in my bio. Um, yeah, so I did that pre pandemic. And so, then, how was that transition for you all? Like, did were there any major changes for you when COVID hit, as to you know how you all were going to communicate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know how much I can actually talk about, but um, but yeah, it did change for sure. Um, and as we know, right, our incarcerated folks got hit extra hard. Um, they, uh, people, people got sick at much higher rates. Um, mm -hmm. it was just, uh, generally people incarcerated do not get as good healthcare as we get on, on the outside. And so, you know, it's just, it was, it was a very hard and very difficult and dark time on our, our people that are incarcerated. And so, yeah, it was heavy in that way for sure. Mm -hmm. And there's still lingering effects for sure right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's probably what I can talk about right now about it. Yeah. Yeah, because I was just curious. I remember listening to a, a podcast. I think it may have been This American Life where uh, the prison system was uh, getting hit. It was the early, early part of COVID. And there was one uh, inmate there who was uh, basically recording everything that was going on. And I think it was got to the point where I, th I believe this was in California and the governor was like, okay, I'm going to let people who have like really low crimes out right and just hoping that you would make it to that day where you would be released you're just thinking about like if they had all of these different types of programs that were coming into the system and that they were no longer there that they were no longer able to do what they needed to do and having that on their mind like the most important thing is to survive during this this part uh of those first you know couple of years you know that we were going through I can only imagine what it would be if you were like connected into a group like that I just want to say thank you for you know doing the work that you are doing um be it you know for your personal pleasure of writing a novel or you know like doing the hard work that you know going to the least of these and taking care of them and, and helping them in this way to be able to you know do whatever inner work that they need within them this is this has been beautiful to talk to you about um in depth from your book to you uh but now as you know mm -hmm. we are at the part of our conversation that is my favorite we want to ask you either what are your top five favorite books of all time ivy is ready i know she got a list <laughs> <laughs> or the five things that you are most excited about that you want people to know. So let's go. Cause I know, I know you're ready. All right. I'm going to share, I'm going to share the shine. I'm going to share, you know, so my friend Ty Chapman, one of my besties has a beautiful book um, called looking for happy. It's a picture book coming out um, in a couple months here. Um, this is about uh, a black boy who is looking for happy. And it's about depression in, in young children and what that looks like um, and what that journey looks like. And, you know, if you're into generational, inter like that kind of work, that's in this picture book. I love, so uh, Ty Chapman, um, he has a poetry collection coming out with Button as well. And that's called Pantheon, I believe. Um, I'm really excited for that too. Um, okay, I, I'm moving on here. Um, <laughs> yourself Claire Forrest uh she is a brilliant lovely uh, also like romantic YA writer um and she um she's in a wheelchair and so her her character is disabled and it's it's about um uh figuring out what college she wants to go to um dealing with uh what happens when accommodations aren't met but also uh being in love and love and all that good stuff as a young person and um, that's Claire Forrest's uh, debut. Um, let's see, how am I, how am I doing here? 
uh, I got, that's that three. I, I took two for Ty. Um, let's see here. And then also, um, I'm going to shout out to my girl, Kalena. Uh, this is a great title. The night when no one had sex. Ah, super mm-hmm. great. Like super great. <laughs> uh, that's YA novel. <laughs> it's so much fun. It's, I read it, I think in like at night or two, it was such a blast. So shout out to my girl, Kalena. And then uh, let's see here. All right, I'll do another shout out to my 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 friend Nick Nick Brooks, uh, prom uh, Promise Boys, super amazing YA, uh, really cool with my publisher. He and I have done a couple of different events together, and I've just been so excited uh, for his shine and all the things that are going on with that book. So, those are my five. <laughs> oh, that's Yay! a solid five right Yay! there. Yay! You did well, <laughs> um, I, you know. What I what we have found, and I want to see if it is true with you that when you all are writing, particularly YA writers, tend to find this community within each other. Like, are how did you all connect? Like, was it the internet? Were there like MFA groups, or did you already know each other? Like, how did that how did that happen? Yes, yes. So I I did get my MFA in writing for children and young adults at Hamlin. Um, and now I am on faculty there. So I will be, too, that's my new job. <laughs> that's where I'm going to be going uh, in July. Um, but that community is magical. Um, and it's just liquid magic. I can't even explain it. The community is such a rock solid community. I, I never feel alone in this field because of them. But also when you meet other YA authors, I don't know if it's just because you're writing for an audience outside of you know yourself like you're thinking about your audience and you're thinking about young people it's just a different a different vibe I guess um and that I love I love and it just really connects you know whoever kid lit folks I think we just we just really love each other a lot it's 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 yeah it, it's a beautiful community I, I think we're magnetic once we see each other we're like okay we're gonna be best friends all right let's go <laughs> uh, yeah and I'm grateful I I get I get to be I get to benefit from that uh for sure from from that magical beautiful community <laughs> nice nice I feel like all of them are lit like literally and figuratively <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure well thank you so much for coming on to our show. Uh, I just want to say congratulations once again on this beautiful debut. Uh, We hope that it flies and takes you off into so many different directions that you could never fathom in your your mind. I know that your family and your ancestors and everyone is excited about what you have brought into the world. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your words with us tonight. Ari, thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, like I'm thinking about three things, like, thank you for, I guess, unleashing this hope, like, you know, for your readers, for the work that you do with your collectives, there's just like so much hope when you, when you speak, when you talk. Um, and then the second one is, you know, I hope this book gets translated into Bree Bree. I'm praying for that for you. Um, Because I think it'll be like a 360 journey. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, if the only person that would read this would be you and me, even though I can't speak the language, I would do it. (laughs) I would do it. And then the third one is, you know, because we do share a child like we, you know, me and you have a son. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, you've done the work. You did it. You know, this is like a phenomenal way of transporting and it's it's very special to me because you know I'm not as versed as words as other people you know this is literally like something that he can, it's tangible like he can hold it and he can be like my mom made this mm. you know and nobody sorry for this language because I know this is why nobody can say shit because my <laughs> mom made this you know like that's something that I always think about like what do I pass on to the next generation and you've done it and I feel like you're gonna do more so rock on girlfriend wow thank you for making cry. <laughs> thank you you're awesome well we we hope we didn't steal too much of your time thank you so much for for spending this evening with us you take care okay thanks Ari bye we hope you enjoyed our show Our show has been produced and edited by Preston Long. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our podcast. 
Our theme song you've been nodding your head to is by Sean Kantrowitz. You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Dammit. That's S-E-A-N-D-A-M-M-I-T. Follow us on Instagram at The Vulgar Geniuses. Bye!